There's a couple of conventions in science illustration that are worth knowing. One is, when you are illuminating the object you're drawing, the direction of the illumination should always be from the upper left. This not only helps settle any uh, uncertainty about how you are going to set up the drawing that you're going to make, but it also helps your audience to interpret what you've done. Knowing that the light is always coming from the upper left uh, makes it much more predictable to how to interpret the shaded areas so that people are interpreting the instructional aspect of your illustration the way that you hoped. The other thing is when you're showing an animal or uh, an invertebrate of any kind, uh, you always have the head either to the, to the top or to the left. For instance, if you're drawing a pair of centipedes together, you might want to have the two heads of your creatures at the top of the illustration. But you wouldn't have the heads at the bottom, and you wouldn't have the heads to the right. They either have to be to the top or pointing to the left. The first thing to establish when you're doing a drawing is just the basic outline of the proportions. I'm actually making some indications here about where I want the aperture's thickness to appear. On a cowrie shell, this opening here is called the aperture. These points at either end are called the rostra. This is the anterior, this is the posterior of the creature. And I mostly just want to, at first, give myself a sense of the proportion of the creature. At this point, you have lots of flexibility to erase, to, re to redesign, to redraw, and so forth. Because basically what you're hoping for here is a fairly accurate representation of the proportion. And this is infinitely fine-tunable. Now you can see that in my proportion here, this area has become a little too, a little too uh, wide. And then you slowly add the details that you want to see. Now again, I'm imagining that the light direction here is always coming from the upper left. Now remember, when you're, draw when you're drawing these things, the uh, reflections that you make are one of the ways that you are allowing your reader to uh, perceive the kind of surface that you're making. So for instance, a sharp-edged reflection implies you have a very shiny surface. A very matte surface is implied with a very gradual shading here. I'm trying to capture some of these fluted marks here on the inside of the aperture edge. And it's important not to just throw these in, but to actually have a sense of how many you're actually making. Now, um, one thing that's important when you're using a pencil is to get a sense of the light and dark range that your particular pencil and paper can have. I would counsel you, try to find paper that has what you would call a little bit of tooth to it. Um, if you find shiny paper or paper that's too heavily sized, we call it, like coated with kaolin, it's very hard to press hard enough to make a mark. And you don't want to press down to make things dark. You make your light lines with a light stroke across the paper. You make your dark lines by going over it again and using the paper as an abrasive to, to, uh, to scrape off or abrade more of the dark material off the pencil. You don't want to get into making your dark areas by crunching down in here because you've now crushed the paper texture. You've made an unusual shine to the line that you've made here that will be very uh, difficult to counter for when this is photographed or scanned. And so you sort of might want to start by making a, a, a gradual shading bar that shows you the potential of what you can do with this particular 
pencil on this particular paper. And again, you want to have as light a hand as possible as you get down to the areas where you're making the lightest shading you can make. So down here, you're going back and forth over the dark areas. You're not grinding down and crushing into the texture of the paper, but you're using this to make some facsimile of the, the values you have access to here. Now since this is actually a carbon pigment pencil, it's very much more difficult to get the things on the light end to be convincing, whereas things on the dark end can be quite, quite, quite easy to make. So this sort of gives me now the sense of how many light and dark values I can manufacture here. And even though this is a white object, um, you're going to have to you're going to have to render areas in uh, in terms of what kind of shading you're going to produce. Are you going to take this to completion, or is there? I don't think so. No, oh, okay. not the amount of time we have. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um. So I would say uh, you start in by just generally configuring the lighter and darker areas to the extent that you wish, and then it's just a matter of gradually filling them in and adding more sharpness and more detail as you go. Now, many times you would use a, a carbon drawing like this as a preliminary. Uh, before you rendered it in ink or in some other way. Or if, for instance, you're on an expedition where you're out in the, out in the field, um, this is a perfectly excellent way to take your notes as visual sketches. And then you can do much more polished illustrations once you return back to civilization if that is your bent to do so. When you get to the edge of an object you're rendering, I often refer to that the way astronomers do, as the limb of the object, when you get to the edge. You know, we think of the area where the light is coming from as being light, and then the area in shadow as being dark. But actually, the edge, the limb of the light area is going to be fairly dark before it abruptly, or with a quick to end transition, becomes uh, the light values you hope for, for the light side of the drawing. Just like on the dark side of the drawing, it's better if the darkest regions don't go all the way to the edge, because you know when you look at an object that's actually standing in shadow, there's an area around the limb of the dark side, if you want to call it that, that is not as dark as the darkest values that you see on the mass of the object. And so, it allows you not only a little bit of extra way to describe the shape of the object, 
but also relieves the darkness on the dark side to the extent that you need that to, Im uh, to imply other objects that are sitting behind it, perhaps. Now I'm using here a carbon pencil and I would counsel you there is another technique for using a carbon pencil in a much more finished but slowly graduated piece of work where you actually take a very fine piece of wet and dry sandpaper and you grind up your pencil into a fine powder and then with an ermine hair brush you actually gradually very slowly start building tones up in the paper by repeatedly stroking the brush with the carbon in it across that area you're developing. Uh, the bad news about that technique is, is it's quite slow, but the good news is it gives you control of fine and delicate shading that is the equal of anything anyone with an airbrush could ever do. You can see I've added some detail to this part of the drawing, but that actually that there's quite a bit of work, a, a lot of work left to do on this. And uh, if I was going to f make this into a finished drawing, I would expect to spend oh another two or three hours uh, working on the, on this. Um, the, the important thing when you're starting out in science drawing is to choose something that you actually love, since you're going to invest the time and increasing your knowledge base uh, in these kinds of subjects, having it be something that you actually have a personal affection for gives you such a huge head start in all the kind of mundane parts of doing the rendering and learning the anatomy. You know, in the case of a cowrie shell, learning what the uh, what the outer edge is, what the aperture is, the rostra, all these kind of information pieces that are important to making a proper illustration come so much more easily, especially at the front end of the process, when it's something that you actually have an affection for and that you actually love. This drawing I'm actually making with a carbon pencil. This particular is a general pencil. Uh, a long time uh, maker of quality pencils. I've used them for many years. If you can get a hold of this kind of a pencil, um, it gives you a, a wonderful range from light to dark in a way that isn't shiny, a problem you might have if you used a graphite-like office pencil. Now let me say at the outset, the things you develop, the hand-eye coordination, the the, the, uh, the, sh the actual mechanics of shading, you can do with any kind of pencil. But by using a carbon pencil and avoiding this semi-shiny reflex from a graphite, you're actually using something that if you just accidentally happen to make a masterpiece, uh, you would actually be able have a much easier time having it scanned and photographed and so forth. Uh, it takes a lot more messing around to get a graphite pencil to serve you in this way because its shininess, its reflectivity uh, ends up being an issue and so you're always looking for ways to defeat it. Whereas in the way of a real carbon pencil, you, uh, you have that part already eliminated from the problem set. I hope that uh, if you uh, have an interest in the natural world that uh, this kind of thing calls to you. And if it does, um, like I say, any, any pencil or piece of stray paper that comes into your possession can be an artifact of your personal development in this way. Um, all the way up to when you have good equipment and great paper and great pencils and all that stuff. Oh, there's, uh, and should you ever decide to go into computers to use software to do, you know, many people say, well, you know, I've spent all this time learning how to render on paper. I don't think I want to start over. There's no starting over. When I teach people computer graphics and computer science illustration, I still have to teach them the basics of what we are starting to demonstrate here. There's absolutely nothing in your personal development as a sketch artist that is wasted on the day you decide to use a computer software program to do your work. Absolutely every reflex, every part of your brain that you've developed in this way is going to be useful for the whole duration of your time in this work. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this works out well for you, and uh, have yourself a great day.